Aloha, everyone. Welcome. We'll be starting in just a moment. Thanks so much for joining us today. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to say aloha and welcome everyone to the, uh, I believe this is the third lecture of the 35th Annual Experts at the Cathedral Lecture Series. My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. I want to send a mahalo to our event partner, Dr. Ralph Cam. He's the curator and coordinator of the expert series. And Dr. Cam is a lecturer with the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program, the American Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. HHF is pleased to co-sponsor this series, and it's this year a collaboration with the 175th anniversary of the construction of Washington Place. So this year's lectures explore six residences that are significant to the life of Queen Liliokulani. Today's presenter will speak about the Queen's Retreat, so known as the Boyd House in Hedeman Estate. Just a note and some housekeeping that we are recording today's presentation that will be available on the HHF YouTube and Facebook pages where they can be viewed immediately afterwards. If you have questions, we'll have a Q&A at the end after our presenter completes his portion. And please feel free to type those questions throughout. Um, yes, and if you haven't already, it's really fun to see where everyone is calling in from. So do type your name in the chat, say aloha or hello and where you're, where you're calling in from, that would be great. Um, our speaker, um, and we'll respond to as many questions as we are able to get to um, at the end portion. We also will have a brief survey at the end and we'd really be grateful if you can take just a, a minute or two and complete that for us. It's very, very helpful. For those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit and we help people save historic places. Um, these places are sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. I would now like to turn over, um, turn it over to Dr. Cam, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Ren, for a special treat today. Uh, Dr. Paul Brennan, as you can tell from this introduction, is a, is a has a wonderful background. He has four degrees, including a PhD in descriptive linguistics which allowed him to conduct research among the Kuvi of India and the Enga of Papua New Guinea, where he lived with his family for 13 years and studied among other things, tribal warfare and reconciliation processes. There, Dr. Brennan founded the Enga Cultural Center, which today is regarded as that nation's uh, prototype for regional cultural centers. On coming to Hawaii in 1981, Dr. Brennan was on the staff of the East West Center, and then he was recruited by the Bernese Pawahi Bishop Museum to work on their archeological contract in Manawili Valley, uh, which if uh, during the lecture, you'll see how that was a uh, propitious uh, moment. He helped establish the Kailua Historical Society 25 years ago and has served as its president for most of that time. Uh, 12 years ago, the society published its award-winning History of Kailua, of which Dr. Brennan was the lead author. For the past 35 years, he has given tours of various locations within Kailua, including uh, this, the topic for today's talk, the Queen's Retreat. So with no further ado, uh, Dr. Paul Brennan. Good 
I'm very happy to join you for this afternoon to be able to share this subject, which has fascinated me over the last more than 40 years. If today you would come with me up to the Queen's Retreat, the road leading there would not be very inviting nor promising. The pavement is narrow, it's cracked, it's overgrown. There are no guardrails to keep you from tumbling off onto the steep banks down below. The trees to the Queen's Retreat have not been trimmed in decades and the lawns have not been mowed in years. No one lives there anymore. The house walls are full of graffiti and the weeds are everywhere. In other words, what I'm describing, it's habitable only for the pigs. And the pigs are happy to be able to come in and out at will. Today, I want to focus on the subject of royal property fit for the queen. And I do that because of the fact that there is such a contrast from what was taking place more than a hundred years ago and what is happening at the present time. More than a hundred years ago, there were all kinds of people moving in and out of the valley. I think it's safe to say that the Queen's Retreat was that place of most intensive activity in all of the Kailua area. And the one who was making that possible was primarily the one who had bought the property in 1893, his name is William G. Irwin. And as you can see in the photographs, William G. Irwin built this home in a very special architectural way. It's a classic country estate. And today the weeds are everywhere. And it's not a safe place for anybody to walk. The store, the, 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 the floor is 10 feet off the ground, up to the ceiling. And it was here that Mr. Irwin began to do his work. Why did he come? What was he interested in? Well, he had one desire, and that was to be able to claim the water that was flowing out of the streams going down to Kawanui Marsh. He wanted his water not in Kailua Ahupua'a, but he wanted it in Waimanalo, where the Waimanalo sugar mill was very much in process. And it was easy for him to be able to jump on his horse and go to the office and be able to return at the end of the day. When he got the water, there was a classic conflict taking place because down alongside Kawinui Marsh, there were those rice farmers that were complaining because they were not getting the water that they were accustomed to. And so that conflict went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1895, a decision was made that the one who owned the property 
would be able to also own the water. To this day, there are To this day, there is water flowing into Waimanalo, and that water is being demanded at a rate which Monawili cannot even keep up with. Today, the water is no longer flowing in the trestles that are elevated, but it's on the ground and it's able to go just as before, and the farmers in Waimanalo are happy to get just as much as they possibly can. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. We were just wondering if we can turn on your video That's so we what can I'm trying see. To do. Yeah, it's on the Zoom menu bar on the bottom, right next to where it says mute. There should be a start video. And I know, should... I tried that. Oh, okay. Well, I tried start video and it it just picks up the same integrated webcam. I tried video settings. Okay, don't worry. That that please let Dr. Brennan just continue. It speaking. should be working now. Let's see. All right. Now now let me do it. I think. Yes, there he is. <laughs> okay, it's such a wonderful face. We want we want to integrate the voice with the face. Okay, please continue. I'm sorry for the interruption to our audience and to Dr. Brennan. Okay, this reminds me of being in the jungle of New Guinea where we had no technology at all. And now coming to this place where we are surrounded by it, it uh, demands of us a flexibility that we never thought we were capable of doing. Um, I want to continue talking a little bit about uh, those who came into Monawili and their purposes for coming there. Uh, it began all the way back in 1849. And in each case, it was for the purpose of being able to establish cattle ranching. So today, dotting the landscape in Monawili, are all of these archeological features related to cattle ranching. 1849, and then Henry Sawyer, 1855. And in 1869, it was the Boyd family who came in. And in each case, they modified their holdings, uh, they placed on the ground what they needed to in order to be able to accomplish their goal. In 1910, C. Brewer purchased the property from Irwin and they held that for a matter of 30 years. And then in 1941, just before the outbreak of World War II, it was the Honeyway Ranch, namely the Castle family, that picked up the purchase. I remember going <clears throat> about 40 years ago to the state capitol and trying to convince our legislators that we should purchase this property. It fell on deaf ears. And we could have had more than a thousand acres in 1983 for the grand total of about three and a half million dollars. Today, that kind of terminology, those kinds of values are long run. Let me focus a little bit on the purposes of the Boyd family. 
it wasn't just that they were interested in cattle, but they were also interested in their connections. And this is how the royal family comes into the picture. We know that in 1874, there was a large party and it was thrown for the Kalakaua family who were close friends of the Boyds. In one of the newspapers dated April 25, 1874, it reads, over the entrance gate of Manawili were the words, Eola Kamoi Kalakaua, and the entire premises were beautifully decorated with ferns and flowers. Here also the people were enthusiastic in their reception of the majesties and the whole party was entertained with Edwin Boyd's characteristic hospitality. The night was passed here and during the evening, the hills of Olamana Ahiki and Papui were brilliantly lighted with bonfires. Unfortunately, at the age of 40, Edwin Boyd died. And his son, James, continued to show these expressions of hospitality, especially to the royal family. There was the carriageway, which was brought, which allowed uh, all the guests to that estate to be able to come in close contact with the Boyd home. And right nearby, there was also the burial, uh, there was also the bath, the queen's bath took place so that whenever the carriage stopped and unloaded the precious cargo, that individual would be able to be shown the hospitality right at the very beginning. There is, uh, if we can switch to number 10 in our slides, um, Michelle, if uh, not the water, there, number 10. There we are. This is the tree that had fallen back in 2005. And from that tree, I was able to salvage enough wood to be able to make this bench, which today sits in Iolani Palace. It was this tree, which grew to a height of 144 feet. And at the base, it had six feet diameter. It's an expression of the hospitality role that those in Monowili have been able to provide to the royal family over all these years. We might ask what it was that interested the queen to be able to come. At the time she was the princess and the princess in 1878 was inspired to be able to write those very memorable words of Aloha Oi, Hawaii's probably best known song. And she talks in there about 
those two lovers who had been seen at a fork in the road and they were expressing their affection for each other. And in the melee that she left us with, she has this line, Eke ona ona noho ikalipo, the charming one who dwells in the shaded bowers. The shaded bowers represent Monawili, and they suggest to us the mystery of this special place. I am so proud whenever I drive on the streets of Honolulu to be able to pass by Washington Place and to know that there is that plaque which makes special the connection between the royal family and those Kanaka who lived in Monawili. The queen reflected on that. And so as I reflect on her writing, it suggests to me that the queen was aware that all the people of her kingdom were united and they belong to this experience of being able to build together a kind of future. Aloha Oi is about hope and promise. It's not about defeat and destruction. It suggests to us that the weeds will be able to be rooted out and the royalty will be able to be shared with all of us. And so I'm grateful to be able to share these few thoughts with you. And I will be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Dr. Brennan, did you want to point to any of the other slides? Because uh, yes. I'm not sure we've been through them. Maybe we could yes. go back to earlier slides and you could say a little about some of them because Michelle needs the numbers, I think, to know which ones to go to. Okay, if we go back to number five, that shows... That one shows the ala nui that surround Monawili. Um, there are these walking paths which lead us over to Waimanalo from Monawili. They are the walking paths that lead us up to the springs and to the streams where the precious water was coming all the way down to Hawaii Nui Marsh. If we can go to the next one. Uh, uh, the tree, we, we had the tree, which is number three. This one's number four, or that was number, there we go. Yeah, this shows you in the alignment behind the large tree which was felled. It shows you the royal palms that made up the, uh, the carriageway leading to the house. And then going to the next one, This gives you an idea of what it looked like back in the 1930s. Here is Mrs. Ald 
who was coming to visit the area. And uh, it shows you the lack of trees that are growing within the valley, the presence of the horses and the kinds of structures that were coming into existence. All along the streams, there was a presence of habitation and these streams were where the possibility for the growing of the color was taking place. If we can go to number seven, uh, I wanted to show you the petroglyph, which is nestled there right at the base of where there was a lithic workshop. And you can see that the image was packed into the large boulder. And there are two of these petroglyphs which now exist and we've been able to locate. But if you think of the place where the Hawaiians were crafting their uh, stone adze blades, very similar to what I'm holding here. I found this one in the vicinity, close to where the Irwin House was located. It shows us the kind of uh, inventiveness, the kind of skill that they possessed, and at the same time, a variety of other stones which were used in not only work, but also in play. That's the way with Mauna Willi. And I'm very happy to be able to share these with you. Dr. Brennan, did you have more to share? Or would you like to entertain questions? I'm not sure if you were able to go through all of the slides. Did yes. you want? <clears throat> I, I think uh, the questions can come now. Okay. So, Ralph, if you would like to join Dr. Brennan, Dr. Cam, I should say. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, one of the earliest questions was, uh, who owns the property now? The owner of the property for the past 12, 20 years has been HRT, Honolulu Rapid Transit. And they are the business arm of the Weinberg Foundation. Uh, another question, what, what type of wood was the bench made from? The name of that tree is hoop pine. And it's interesting that it, <clears throat> it was brought here the, by, um, we, we think it was brought here about 1870 from Australia. And because that tree towered over all the palms and the other trees growing there. It had such a dominant presence. So from 1870 until 2005, when it was taken down because of the termites, it was able to grow and just became so dominant and it's fascinating to me that they would place that exotic foreign origin tree at the end of the carriageway. Is there, was there any damage when the tree was felled? There, there was, uh, because the termite activity was so strong in the tree, um, the landscapers were only able to go up about to the 80-foot height, 
and they topped it and the felling of the tree caused it to land on top of five royal palms that were destroyed. Uh, one more question. Uh, the Hedman house obviously is abandoned now. Uh, the, the person asking the question thought the golf course is going to restore it and use it for something. That was uh, what we were hopeful. And we were also given a sense that they were moving in that direction. Uh, but the golf course and the owners of the property have not succeeded in being able to do that. And I think that uh, they've abandoned that idea completely. When the Weinberg Foundation took it over, HRT, uh, they also talked to us about the possibility of a golf academy and uh, luxurious weddings being able to take place on the site of the Queen's Retreat. Okay. Are, are there any books or sources that you can suggest for further reading on the home? Uh, I would like to suggest the book that the Kailua Historical Society has published. Uh, this is simply called Kailua, and it's still available in the bookstores, and we are pleased to be able to send them out to any bookstores that want to sell them, as well as to individuals who might contact us individually. Okay. Uh, another question, where uh, was the original handwritten lyrics? Uh, where were they penned by the queen? Um, I think that um, the originals were when the queen was in Monowilly and she began making notes as she was on horseback going back to Honolulu. And uh, now those original notes are in the state archives in Honolulu. Do you, um, do you remember the name of the case about the water rights? Um, William G. Irwin, versus um, let's see I think it's Conneway Ranch because uh, Conneway Ranch was the owner of the land that was being leased by the three rice mills Uh, what what part of Mount Wheely is the house located in? Uh, it's in Upper Mount Wheely. It's a, an elevation of about uh, four hundred feet above sea level, and uh, from where the Poly Highway is located, it's a diff it's a distance of about one mile altogether. Were there any gardens on the estate? Uh, there was uh, one especially dedicated to uh, the queen herself. It was called the Queen's Garden. And it was here that there were special trees planted. There was mangosteen. Um, there's African tulip. There's bunya bunya. Uh, a whole variety of flowers, including the rose of Monowilly, that is referred to in the Queen's song, Aloha Oi. Okay. 
Can you uh, tell us about the relationship between the Voids, the Hedemans, and the Irwins? Is there a, a tie between them? We think that um, because William G. Irwin was uh, so preoccupied with his business of uh, sugar king, he, um, he had very little to do with the Boyds themselves. Um, the Boyds were very strong supporters of the monarchy. Um, there was opposition coming from those who wanted to overthrow the kingdom. And um, I think that during their time of living together up there, um, there was very little contact that was being made. However, there was great contact between um, those who came in after the, um, after the Boyds had sold their property. And uh, John Hurd, for example, lived in that same house. And it was the Cacalias who came in as caretakers after he had left. And so we have a variety of people coming in, but always those who lived in the Boyd estate were very much um, interested in promoting sovereignty. And um, it was my pleasure to be able to interview them each uh, in succession and to hear their perspectives. Um, the Hedemans now came in only after the Kaneoi Ranch had purchased that property in 1941. And although it's sometimes called the Hedeman Estate, they never owned the property. They never owned the house. They were the caretakers and it was because uh, Erling Hedeman's uh, wife was a relative of the uh, Castle family. How, how would the queen have gotten uh, from a town to this estate? Um, we know that it was mostly by horseback um, or carriage. And in 1874, um, it was certainly um, by, by horseback that she was able to come. And then uh, they, they came through Waikiki, through what is now Hawaii Kai, went to Waimanalo, and then picking up the old government road, they came from Waimanalo directly into Monomili because that was a well-traveled route that uh, anyone on horseback or walking would have been able to travel. Um, the old government road um, now is built over by the golf course and uh, there is no access to that old government road uh, from either the Monowilly side or from Waimanalo side. Uh, the the trip must have been perilous at some points. Um, I think that it was probably perilous going across the Anioni Nui Ridge, and uh, certainly going on the old government uh, on the uh, old Poly Road. It was uh, very treacherous. Uh, we know the history of that road. 
And we know that um, back in 1900, um, there was limited traffic. And then in 1920, there was major road work being done on the poly, straightening out some of the curves. But um, we do know that um, prior to those times there, there were few wheeled vehicles. Um, we do know that the rice mill um, down at the entrance to Monowilly, um, that rice mill was sending rice over the poly by means of mule teams. And uh, Wong Leong was the one relative of CKIE and City Mill, which gets its name from rice milling, was the primary uh, sponsor, uh, the benefactor of all of that milling. Did, they ever, did the queen ever get in an accident? Uh, she did. Uh, in 1881, it's interesting to hear her account because in her autobiography, she talks about that experience. She devotes in her book um, about a half a dozen pages. And uh, she, she says, and I quote, after a generous lunch in Waimanalo on the estate of Mr. Cummins, we left for Monowilly, the country place of Mr. and Mrs. Boyd, in whose hospitable mansion we passed the night and left our gentle hostess regretting that our stay had been so short. But events proved that my tour was not to be extended far beyond the residence. For we had proceeded on our way to Kaniyoi but a few steps when a singular accident happened to my carriage. My horses were driven by Mr. Joseph Pele Luhe. And in some unaccountable manner, the reins of one of the horses became entangled in the bit of another. We were descending the steep side of a hill and the result was that the driver had no longer control of the animals. Consequently, the carriage came down the hill with such velocity that I was thrown violently out and landed between two rocks. But fortunately, there was a bit of marshy ground where I struck. It was a matter of immediate wonder that my life had been spared. Certainly no one could have been nearer to instant death. We know that those who were farewelling her at the Monowilly estate, uh, came rushing to her aid. Uh, they made a stretcher and four men carried her on the old government road over to Waimanalo. And the Waimanalo sugar mill fired up their steamer, put her aboard, and she sailed around to Honolulu Harbor. In the meantime, her husband and the royal physician came on horseback, hearing about this accident that had befallen her. Unfortunately, there was no permanent injury to her. And for the next six weeks, she was able to convalesce at Washington Place. So the story has a happy ending. And I think it, um, it also underscores the connection of the queen with that area. 
In spite of that mishap, she returned again and again. And the hospitality and care and comfort of that experience was more than able to compensate for that accident that had befallen him. When, when did the house become abandoned? When was the last? Um, it was 20 years there? ago. Um, the last ones to live there were security people. And uh, they, they were told that they were no longer needed in that position. And likewise with the Koki house, uh, Roy and his wife and son moved out just about the same time. So in 1999, 2000, uh, there were lots of changes that were happening. And some of them were within the control of HRT, <clears throat> but some of them had already happened when the previous owner had the property. Is the uh, home on any of the, either the state historic register or the national historic register? Unfortunately, um, the owners of the property have not put it on the state register. And, um, we are hopeful that there might be a change in that status in the years to come. Um, there is a hui of uh, us who represent 10 civic organizations of Kailua and a broad spectrum of the population of Kailua. We are working together to try to be able to make a transfer of that property as soon as possible. Then we will have access. Then we will be able to go in and not only mow the lawn, but come down, uh, cut down some of the Albizia trees and so on. The, um, the Queen's Bath. I know you uh, showed a slide of it during the uh, during your talk, but can you, uh, Michelle, could you put that back up? The picture of the Queen's Bath. Could you tell us how the water got to the Queen's Bath? <clears throat> I certainly can. Um, there was a a water trestle bringing water from Ainone Spring all the way down from the spring entrance, a distance of about a third of a mile. And uh, the water flowed into that um, conduit and was able to serve the three families who lived in the area of the Queen's Retreat. Sorry, what number is the photo? Uh, that photo would be eight. Uh, number eight. eight. So it's hard to tell the scale. Uh, could you give us rough dimensions of how big this is? Yeah. Um, we're looking at a sizable jacuzzi style, if you will. Um, it's uh, cut into the ground to a depth of about three feet. And it's about five feet wide and uh, a length of about eight or nine feet. I'm assuming and, that the water uh, came in cold. We think that the water was heated 
just across the road from this location, there was the uh, kitchen, an outdoor building to the Boyd estate. And we think that it would have been very likely that the water was heated and placed there just at the proper time when the dignitary would have been arriving. Sorry, I'm uh, scrolling down. Uh, the house, the the Boyd, the house that was on the Boyd House site. Uh, are there any pictures of the Boyd House itself? Um, <clears throat> we don't have uh, uh, real good photographs going back to the nineteen the early 1900s. Um, we have a picture in the book of Mrs. Ald, who was a companion of Liliwo Kalani. And uh, she was able to come there. We're constantly searching for more photographs from uh, any source that we might get. Um, while we still can track them down. Now, there's also a request for you to talk about, there's a black and white photo with running water in it. Yes. <clears throat> can you That's tell part of the Monowilly Ditch. Uh, what number and, is that? Uh, the Monowilly Ditch. Think, what's the number of the photos in it? Four. Oh, that's number four. There it is. Uh, 40 years ago, when I first saw the Monowilly Ditch, it was on wooden trestles. And uh, the Department of Agriculture came in and removed all of those. And uh, the water now flows on the ground. There was so much seepage before from the water flume, from the wooden flume. But uh, now it's on the ground and it's encased in cement for the most part. And the water is able to flow quite well and in an unrestricted way over to the Korean tunnel. And then it flows down into Waimanalo. Can you uh, tell us um, about some of the research that you have done regarding the site? <clears throat> I uh, began interviewing some of the old timers when I first arrived in Hawaii more than 40 years ago. I realized that they had special stories and uh, they needed to be uh, documented as quickly and completely as we could. And uh, I've interviewed more than a hundred people who now for the most part have left this life uh, it was either interview them or follow the paper trail. And the paper trail came later. We were able to access many of those documents. And one of the best sources of information has come from the archives of Kaneoi Ranch. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge about this uh, important historic site. I think it's uh, time now to hand this over to Andrea to uh, close our day and tell people also how they can access uh, this talk and previous talks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. And thank you, Dr. Brennan. It's, it's a treat to sit at your feet, so to speak, and to hear all of this this knowledge and these stories and research. So thank you so much from all of us. 
And thank you, Dr. Kemp, for curating the series. Um, I also want to thank everybody for being here with us today. Um, I would like to especially thank my colleague, Michelle Kisek, who has been sharing the slides and just stepped up um, to, to help and make things go smoothly. So thanks to everyone. Um, I also want to welcome everyone to join us next Thursday, February 24th, that that will be our fourth lecture again at noon, from noon to one, and we will explore Mua Lalani, a location used to plan the Wilcox Rebellion of 1889, and a place for discussion about the proposed constitution of 1892. It also inspired the song, Mua Lalani, and I don't want to share too much, and, and Dr. Cam will be the presenter, so um, Dr. Cam is also the author of Remembering the Royal Residences of Kapalama, the homes of Princess Ruth Ke'eli Kolani and Queen Lilio Kalani, a Hawaiian Journal of History from 2013. I want to also encourage anyone who is with us today who is obviously interested in this type of content, if you're not already signed up for the HHF e-newsletter, um, the link is up. Thank you for sharing that slide, Michelle. We encourage you to do that. We share information about many things, not just HHF programs, but programs across the islands. And I also want to uh, ask you um, respectfully to consider supporting Historic Hawaii Foundation in our work. We do many things in addition to educational piece, which we're sharing with you today. And you can become uh, a donor or a member, and you can find more information at the Join Us link that you see on the screen right now. Um, finally, I just want to say thank you and wish everybody good health, um, finding time to do things you love and be with people you love. And thank you for loving history and heritage and for being part of our ohana. And we will see you next week. Aloha. Oh, I want to also thank Irish, who is helping Dr. Brennan behind the scenes with the technology because he's been very, very helpful. Thank you, everyone. Oh, hui ho. Hui ho.